Daniel chapter 7, our study tonight, the foundation really of all prophecy is Daniel 7, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 9, I said 7, but I meant Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 27. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, please God help me to rightly represent you. Lord, not only do you know the future, you tell the future, but for us, you hold the future. And tonight we celebrate a future that will bring you honor and glory. A future that will answer all of our prayers. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This prophecy is fulfilling that very prayer. So speak to our hearts. Give us ears to hear and hearts to respond. And I guess most importantly, Jesus, is would you strike within us, each and every one of us, the urgency of the hour? Because we're living, Lord, in those moments before the end comes. May we be committed to winning the lost and the hurting, and the hungry, and the broken, the needy, the confused, the fearful, and the angry. Lord, may we be all and only about sharing your word, this wonderful gospel, with a world that doesn't comprehend the times that we're in. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, if they're not yet born again, that maybe this prediction of the future would light a fire in their heart, a fire that says, I need to be rescued from this. Lord, ask them to be yours and open your arms and receive them in the family of God. We love you. We thank you. We honor you tonight. Speak to us, we pray. Amen. I've been thinking today about the future. We all want to know the future. It's just something in us that says, I I, I have to know the future. And obviously, there's billion-dollar industries predicated on predicting a future that they know nothing about. But it's something that we always want. I remember as a very little boy listening to a psychic on KFI Radio in Los Angeles every Sunday night. His name was Kenny Kingston because people would call and he would tell them their future. And all he would have to know is their name, their first name, and their birth date, and they would give it to him. And he would say, oh, sweet spirit, and he would say these nice things. And I was so fascinated that I always wanted to call And I knew I couldn't call because some of you won't understand this, but this was back in the days when telephones were attached to walls and they had cords. So we couldn't take our cell phone in and do something privately, and there's no way my mom or dad would let me call. But I always wanted to know. Now, after 26 years of being a pastor, I figured out why we want to know the future, why it's so fascinating to us. And the reason is simple. It's because that we think by knowing it, we can manipulate it. Maybe we can change it. Maybe we can move things around and avoid the troubles. And just maybe, who knows, we can change the future in our favor. Well, tonight I present to you the future But it's a future that can't be manipulated. It's a future that's already been written. And it is true. It is the word of God. And there is no changing it. So maybe tonight, we can be the ones who are changed. Chapter 9, verse 20 says this. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel... And making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, 
the man that I had seen in the earlier vision came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, in previous studies, we've talked a lot about the type of man that Daniel was. We've talked about the incidents out of chronological order. But, but now what we're talking about is the results of his prayer. A man who was deeply committed to prayer, even though he was captive in Babylon, a place that was as ungodly as, well, let's just say the United States of America is in 2021. And Daniel prayed, and we spent a lot of time last week talking about the elements of effective prayer that we could learn from Daniel's prayer. Well, this is just a little bit different. One of the things I want to point out, I don't want to belabor it because I spent some time on it last time, is that this prayer, I told you I had Paula read it to me and I timed it, it was two and a half minutes, the prayer that we studied last week. And I want to reinforce that in two and a half minutes, less than, because it was while he was still speaking, God answered his prayer. If you're here tonight and your prayers haven't been answered, <clears throat> you don't feel like they're being heard in heaven, well, then I refer you to last week's study so that you can find out what it takes to get your prayers heard because God wants to answer your prayers. We're going to see that wonderfully in our study tonight. Now, at the end of verse 21, it says, I'd seen the, in, uh, Gabriel who had come to me in swift flight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is one of the places in the Bible where we get the idea that angels have wings and they fly around. That not, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that that's true. It's just that this is one of the places that people find the idea there. Now, Gabriel, we're told, was dispatched from heaven, and his trip was so swift, his answer to Daniel's prayer came so quickly, that in less than three minutes, Gabriel had arrived with the answer. The word swift here is telling. It means that powerful Gabriel, he's an archangel, the sight of whom took Daniel's breath away earlier in this book, flew to Daniel not only quickly, but he flew in such a way, the Hebrew word says that he flew to the point of fatigue. Now, we don't imagine that angels can get fatigued, but the urgency here is important. Now, when we get into chapter 10 next week, we're going to see some behind-the-scenes spiritual warfare that's going on that will help us prepare for our own trials in life. But Gabriel truly was on a mission from God. A very short prayer, a very specific answer. And all Daniel, because he was so godly, all Daniel had to do was ask. In Psalm 141, the first two verses, David said this, O Lord, I call to you, come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. One of the things that we learned from our study last time is that we've got to be willing to be in that place of sacrifice. It's like worship. Maybe today you had this miserable day and things just couldn't have gone worse and you walk into a church and here we got Matthew and Vero and they're leading worship and you see people lifting their hands and you see tears flowing down. She says, well, well, I'm just not into it today. Remember, prayer, like worship, is always a sacrifice. David said, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. It's always a sacrifice. Daniel kept the times of prayer the Jewish times of prayer and sacrifice, even though, literally, there were no times of prayer and sacrifice because he'd been whisked away to Babylon. Now, the question for all of us as we begin this study into the future tonight is this. Does living in our own modern-day Babylon change you? Have you found yourself compromised? Maybe the reason your prayers aren't being answered is because there's too much Babylon in you in 21st century America. Have you allowed the culture that we live in change you? Daniel didn't allow the culture in Babylon to change him. Not only was Daniel in an evil world, not only did that culture try to strip away all of his Jewishness and all of his attachment to God, Daniel kept doing what men of God do. Does living in our own modern-day Babylon change you? 
Does it change your loyalties? I had the craziest question today on the radio program, and it's fascinating me, and I can't let go of it. And it was a question from somebody named John, and he was asking about, is it okay for Christians to follow celebrities on social media? And my first thought is, well, of course it's okay, but I mean, why would anybody want to do that? What do they possibly have to add to your walk with Jesus? And, and uh, he listed some names of people who are professing Christians, Justin Bieber and, and um, I can't remember some of the other names, uh, uh, Kanye West and, and a couple of others. And I just thought, well, well, we hope they're Christians and praise the Lord if they are. But what value is it? as opposed to the danger that can create. Does the world that we live in change you? Now, whether you're aware of it or not, if you're active on social media, it's changing you. And it means that we've got to work harder to stay close to Jesus. We've got to work harder to stay focused on Him. We've got to guard our hearts and our minds because this world is trying to steal everything that we know and love about our Jesus. They're trying to steal that away from you. If you let this culture influence your walk, you're going to compromise. So the way we protect that is to be like Daniel and be immovable. In our study this coming Sunday, Paul says to stand firm. And we've got to be men and women who are immovable in our commitment to Jesus Christ in these last days. Honestly, if you're not in the Word, if you're not a man or woman of prayer, it's going to be impossible to withstand what the enemy is going to do to you using the world that we live in. Once your prayers answered, answer these challenges tonight. Have you been compromised by the world? Do you act like Christians at church or around other Christians? But when you're around people in the world, you sort of drop all of that and behave like they do. Are you as aware of God's presence in your life as Daniel was here in impossible circumstances? The answer to that, of course, is that you should be because unlike you, Daniel did not have the Holy Spirit living in him. Don't let the culture that we live in compromise you. Now, the answer to his prayer is beyond wonderful and specific. I truly believe that God has answers to some of your deepest, most heartfelt prayers tonight. And all you've got to do is make a decision to be his man or his woman so that those prayers can be answered. Change should and could begin tonight in some of your hearts. Verse 22 says, He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I've now come to give you insight and understanding. I'm always sort of blown away here by the normality of the conversation. I can't imagine Gabriel, the angel who heralds Jesus, standing in front of me and just talking to me like this. I've just come to tell you what the meaning of your dream is, the vision, give you insight and understanding. And then he says this, and I love this, as soon as you began to pray, an answer was given now, only if you really want God's will done in your life can that sentence be true of you. There are times when I've been praying, out walking with the Lord, and as soon as I began praying, I felt like the Lord was saying, yes, yes, but I haven't even finished asking you. You don't have to. I know everything. i got to tell you, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling of comfort. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are, and please underline the words, highly esteemed. It's a great choice of words. The Hebrew word is chamad, and I think it's incompletely translated in our English versions. In the NIV, the highly esteemed, in the King James, and the New King James versions, they use greatly beloved. I think greatly beloved is better, but I think it is also incomplete. Here's what I want you to understand. The idea here is that Daniel was exceedingly desirable in heaven. 
You know what that means? As believers, we're all exceedingly desirable in heaven. It happens all the time, and I understand it. Uh, I understand the emotions that go behind it, but I listen to people all the time saying, well, I, I would pray, but I just don't feel worthy of praying. I've done so many terrible things. How could God love me? You are exceedingly desirable in heaven. You are beloved. And because you're beloved, God truly wants to answer your prayers. And I think a lot of us, we just need to ask God for the faith to truly believe that. Because if we do, and prayers start getting answered, then you're going to turn into a prayer monster. And I mean that in the most favorable sense. You're going to be someone who prays about everything because you're eager to get the answers. A lot of times we ask for things, our heart's not right, our motives aren't right, and, and God wants to answer the prayer, but he can't do it yet because we're not right. But there are a whole lot of things that you're praying for and things that I'm praying for that God has already given you the answers and all you got to do is make sure you're in a position where God can reveal that to you. Now, he's not going to send Gabriel as a messenger to you. But in those moments when he says, of course, or yes, I've been waiting to say yes, enjoy those moments and seize them and don't forget them. Daniel was exceedingly desirable in heaven. He was precious to heaven. And that's important because, as I said, you and I are also precious to heaven. Psalm 139 verse 17 says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me. This is David. David, who's done some really horrible things. And here's what he's saying. He says, God, you think about me all the time. And the things you think about, you don't think about the, the mistakes I've made, the, the times I've blown it. You think precious thoughts toward me. And then he says, how vast is the sum of them. All of that to convince you, hopefully, that you are, we are, what God thinks about night and day. Do you remember the first time you ever were in love, or at least you thought you were in love, and you were consumed? Now, for most of us, it happened around junior high school. I remember a girl that I was crazy about. I thought I couldn't live without her, and I wrote her name on every available inch of my body. I stalked her, my notebooks, everything else. And I just thought, if I can't have her, the world is going to end. That's the way the Lord thinks of us. He loves you. He thinks about you all the time. You are, we are the object of his love. And if we would seek a God who loves us like that, with the same kind of heart that Daniel has sought him with, then too your prayers and mine would be answered the same way. Will you purpose in your hearts to receive God's love for you. Stop thinking he's angry. Stop thinking he's mean. Stop thinking that he's going to scold you or rebuke you. Just enjoy the fact that he loves you. And when you want to argue with him, well, I'm not lovable, just, just get over you. He loves you that much. Daniel the Beloved. In the New Testament, his counterpart is John the Beloved. John named himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's not coincidental that they are the two who got these fabulous end times prophecies. John's revelation, of course, we're studying here on Friday nights. We just started the Great Tribulation in Revelation chapter 6. But the connection between being beloved by God and knowing it and receiving these wonderful, wonderful visions is not a coincidence at all. Gabriel says, therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy-seven is a decree for your people and your holy city to finish transgression. I'm going to say this several times, the first times right now. This is about Israel, your people, and your city. This is about Israel, God's dealing with Jews. Seventy-seven is decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Can you imagine the scope of that one verse? In that one verse, God says that he's going to finish transgression. That means he's going to put an end to sin. I'm ready for sin to end. I hope you are as well. I'm especially ready for my sin to end. To atone for wickedness. Now, from Daniel's perspective, that hadn't happened. But of course, from our perspective, it happened nearly 2,000 years ago. To bring in everlasting righteousness. That has not happened yet. That is still prophecy unfulfilled. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy, that hasn't happened yet. Jesus has not yet taken his place on the throne of David. Now, if you're looking at a King James or New King James Bible, the 77s are 70 weeks. That's a Jewish way of saying 70 groups of seven weeks are what is decreed, and that is the entirety of human history. Now, since we can do math, we know that 70 times 7 is 490, and that means all of history from Daniel's perspective now is going to be complete in 490 years. Gabriel is telling him that when these 490 years are over, then everything is going to be done, and we're going to be with Jesus in heaven, a new heaven and a new earth forever and ever. Now again, remember the Great Tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel, which is what the Great Tribulation is, is all and only about Israel. That's all. It's not about us. If we're going to understand the timing of the end, the last days that we're in, we must never forget that all of it deals with Israel. God has to finish fulfilling his promises, the promise he made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to, to Moses, to uh, Samuel, to, to all of the prophets that we've talked about. Those promises must be fulfilled. God doesn't give us, the church, too much in the way of last day's information because his focus is Israel. Now, one of the problems that we have with prophecy, and I think this is unique to the United States of America, we have this idea that prophecy can't be fulfilled that doesn't include us. We sort of set our clock. You'll hear us say it all the time. Well, things are getting so bad. Just look around where we live and everything is getting so very dark. That's just a picture of a world that's fallen into sin, but it has nothing to do with prophecy because this is not about the United States of America. And we've got to stop thinking that way or we're going to miss completely the point of this prophecy. The church will be gone. When the church is taken out, of the United States, this country is going to be given over to total darkness. And that's why, as we get specific tonight regarding the final seven years on earth, we have to remember this is only about Israel and how God is going to deal with those who oppose her. The final seven years, as I said, are a time when God brings fulfillment to the promises that he made to the patriarchs. Now, seven years, or the 70th week of Daniel, because it's all and only about judgment and fulfillment of his promise to Jews and the reception of their Christ, their Messiah, we need to understand that at this particular point, this has nothing to do with anything that we're ever going to see. I tried to make that point last Friday night in talking about the Great Tribulation as we began in Revelation 6, that those things that we're talking about, as awful as they are, isn't something we have to concern ourselves with because we're not going to be here. But what we do have to do is be concerned enough about the people for whom he died to tell them, to warn them about what's coming. We owe it. Paul said, I'm a debtor both to Greek and to Jew. Well, we're debtors 
to everybody who's still alive in these last days, to everyone who's rejected Jesus Christ. And we've got to be bold enough to declare the truth about Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead all of the time. Now, I talked about putting an end to transgression and putting an end to sin. I think we need to remember that it's going to happen then, it's not going to happen now. I think, sadly, there's too many of us, especially in the West, who are trying to make earth heaven. We want to fix all the problems now. We want to get everything to be better now. I think it's one of the reasons so much of the church has been lost in a political quagmire. Because we want answers and we want solutions. There aren't any. This world is wasting away. And our New Testament is very specific about the kind of world that we live in. Remember, our job is to tell people so that they can avoid that world. Now, the Bible cannot be any more clear that this will be the end of time on earth as we know it, the end of sinful life. Obviously, that hasn't happened yet. He also notes that prophecy will be sealed, and by that he doesn't mean secreted, but what he means is that prophecy will be completed. In other words, at the end of the 490 years, there's nothing else to wonder about. Because it will all be completely fulfilled, and the only thing that will have tens of thousands of years multiplied over and over and over infinitely, the only thing we'll have to worry about is just hanging out with Jesus and learning the secrets that we can't even be, we don't even know the questions to ask. So at the end of 490 years, there's nothing left to accomplish on this world. Now, often this is where people lose their focus on eschatology. When we place the church in the tribulation, or when we contend that God's promises to Israel now belong to the church, that's called replacement theology, prophecy then ceases to make any sense at all. It has no value. We need to keep this critical portion of Scripture in view if we understand it in the correct timing then all of this should make perfect sense. So the question is, when does all this happen? Well, here's the timetable, verse 25. Gabriel says, no one understand this. I wonder if he was taking notes, Daniel. No one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, of course, a reference to the Christ, Jesus, The anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Now, we can do math. That's a total of 69 sevens. This is the first indication that after 69 sevens, there's going to be sort of a technical challenge. Things are going to be a little bit different. So when will he come? Well, we know exactly when that is. From Nehemiah chapter 2, we have a record of this fulfillment. It would be March 14th, according to our calendar, corresponding to our calendar, of 445 B.C. That is the time when Artaxerxes issued the decree allowing Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the gates and wall of the city for defense. And then they could rebuild the city, but they had to have defense. So that was the date. Again, March 14th, 445 B.C. Now, the reason that date is so important is because if you take 483 years, that's the six, the seven sevens and the 62 sevens, on a Jewish calendar of 360 days, that means 173,880 days is the time frame for the anointed one to announce himself as the Jewish Christ, the Messiah. We know that on what we call triumphal entry or Palm Sunday, Jesus came. The date was April 6th, 32 AD, according to the widely accepted scholarship of Sir Robert Anderson. And that means 173,880 days from March 14th, 445 B.C. If Jesus doesn't show up in Jerusalem proclaiming himself king and being proclaimed by others as king, then the prophecy has failed and we don't have a savior. 
It's a staggering fulfillment of prophecy, so staggering that it's impossible to ignore. Again, if Jesus hadn't been there at exactly that moment, if the children hadn't been crying out, Hosanna, if the crowd hadn't been sort of preening, trying to find out, who is it, who is it? It's Jesus. I've taught this so often every Palm Sunday. I talk about the fulfillment of this prophecy. That's how critical it is. And yet they rejected him. We'll see that in a moment. They rejected him. They didn't want Jesus to be their king. They heard Jesus teaching, even though he did miracles, even though he's there on the day that everybody knew that he would be there, even though the crowds were huge in anticipation of finding out finally when the Christ would come. When they saw him, they were disappointed. Now I point that out because there are times when we're disappointed in Jesus too. When things don't work out the way we want them to or when a prayer doesn't get answered specifically the way we ask that it be answered. Maybe in those times when we get a bad diagnosis from a doctor or we lose a job or our marriage is breaking up or a child breaks our heart and we wonder, God, why did you do this? Why didn't you stop it? Well, it's in those moments we're no different than the crowd that was disappointed. It was Jesus. Jesus wasn't teaching what they wanted. They wanted to be delivered from Rome. Jesus said, no, no, if your enemy hits you in the cheek, turn the other cheek and let him strike you again. But you see, we have to deal with who he is and what he's taught. We can't make him who we want him to be. For you and for me, Jesus did come, and he came at just the right moment. He says, on that day it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Now, the first seven or 49 years is the time that it will take to rebuild the temple destroyed by the Babylonians. We have New Testament corroboration of that. You're going to rebuild the temple in three days, they told Jesus, misunderstanding what he was saying. It took us more than 50 years to build this temple. So it took 49 years. The times of trouble refer to the opposition that Jews have always encountered, first when they came to rebuild the walls and the city. Nehemiah records the opposition Ezra also records the opposition. But what's true historically, we know, is that Israel has always faced opposition when trying to do what God wanted them to do. When Israel returned to their homeland in 1948 under the leadership of David Ben-Gurion, the world moved by sentiment because of the Holocaust of more than six million Jews in World War II. Sort of offering a peace offering to Jews, come back to your homeland. But you see, all of the neighbors around them have been plotting from the very beginning to ensure that never happened and their desires to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And that began again in 1948. It's never stopped. And here we are in 2021. And the animosity toward and the hatred for Israel is greater than ever. Israel used to have a big brother in the world, a protector. It was the United States of America. They no longer can count on us. And so the times of opposition will never Stop. Verse 26 says, After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. Now, Jesus talked about this. And this is where in our prophecy timeline, people often get confused. So Gabriel is intentionally making a distinction between the times here that we need to understand. After the 62 sevens. Now, just for Repetition value after seven sevens and 62 sevens. And then he says, okay, after the 62 sevens, 
This is going to happen. He's going to be cut off. And we know Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. For those of us who are Gentiles and believers, we think, how could they not accept him? With all the miracles that he did, the way he taught with authority, the, the fact that, that he came in exactly the right moment. He showed up at a time when they expected him. How could he not receive what he came for, his inheritance, Israel? And the answer is, they just didn't want him to be king over them. They had expectations that he would deliver them from Rome. I'm watching the second season of The Chosen when I can get it in during lunch or something. And it's fascinating. In one of the scenes, uh, they're asking the disciples, so what do you want? And one, one of the disciples said, you know, all I want is for Rome to go away and hopefully one day a pretty wife. That's the desire of every Jew. We want the Christ to come. We want peace. Then it was Rome, now it's the Arab neighbors. All we want is peace. After the 62 sevens, he will be cut off. And this is the place where the timeline stops. The Messiah will be cut off, not getting what he came for. And we know he came for his people, Israel. Matthew chapter 15, verse 24, Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under wings, but you were not willing. Now, I don't want to get off of the context of this Bible study, but we need to understand that the reason people reject Jesus Christ always, then and now, is the same reason they're unwilling it's not because they're unable. Everybody can believe. It's that they won't believe. And the reason that Jesus was rejected the first time, the reason Jesus rejected when you share him with people now is because they don't want to stop sinning. But you were not willing, he says. God came for his own, and his own rejected him. And still, it shouldn't surprise us so much. Sadly, in the lives of some of us who are believers, and I'm talking about genuine believers, we make decisions to reject Jesus on a daily basis. Not rejecting him as our savior, but certainly rejecting the way he wants us to live. Rejecting him as our Lord, meaning he's in charge. I don't really have a say-so, Lord. We do what we want, and, and that's what Paul describes as quenching the Spirit of God. And we find ourselves in a place where our prayers can't be heard. We find ourselves in a place where we're falling farther and farther away from Jesus every day. And it's all because of an unwillingness to surrender to his will for our lives. I always think it's a good thing Jesus never had a rejection complex. Now that Gabriel is making a distinction here between the 69th and 70 weeks of Daniel is something that absolutely has to capture our attention. Another thing that happens because of this is that the prophetic clock stops for a time. We have 70 weeks, 490 years until everything is finished. But after 69 weeks, or 483 years, there's a technical problem. Have you ever been at a sporting event when the clock stopped and they couldn't get it running? And you wonder, well, how long is the delay going to be? Well, that's exactly what's happened prophetically now for thousands of years. Nobody knows how long the clock is going to stop. Now, the world looks at that as a problem. As a believer in Christ, I pray that you don't look at that as a problem. What God is doing is a new thing. You remember Jesus' ministry? He talked a lot about new wineskins. You don't take old wine, or, or rather new wine, and put it in an old wineskin because the fermentation process would burst the old wineskin. It would already be stretched out. He says, no, you put new wine in a new wineskin. And Jesus says, in this pause, between the 69th and 70th week of Daniel, I have a new wineskin for you. 
Now, the theological term is a dispensation. Don't let the words scare you. There's some dispensational crazies out there. I know. I get them calling me on the radio show. But we are here at Calvary Chapel dispensationalists. But balanced dispensationalism is important. It simply means that God deals with different people at different times throughout history in different ways. And people say, well, God doesn't change, so how can that be? Well, God dealt with Jews by the law, didn't he? But Jesus says, I've come full of grace and truth. He now deals with us not according to law, but he deals with us according to grace, God's unmerited favor to the infinitely undeserving. Now, we also know that this prophetic pause has taken now nearly 2,000 years. And because it's taken so long, people keep thinking, well, God isn't going to fulfill his promises. Something is wrong. When is he going to come? You Christians keep saying he's going to come. And Peter scolds him. He says, God's not delaying his coming. He's not slack. You scoffers, he said. God is being patient, unwilling that any should perish. Now, i got to tell you, I want Jesus to come now. I want Jesus to come tonight. But if he doesn't, there's somebody who's going to get saved tomorrow who's going to be thrilled that he didn't. I got saved in 1991. I'm so grateful Jesus didn't come in 1988 the way a thousand people predicted he would. 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. I would have been left behind and plunged into the Great Tribulation. I was thrilled for his patience. The hard thing for us is to be equally thrilled for his patience when all we want is for Jesus to come and put an end to sin. I want him to put an end to my sin. I want that to happen tonight. But if he doesn't, it means that we've got a mission to accomplish. Just as surely as Gabriel was on a mission from God, you and I are on a mission from God in these last days. That's why we've got to be about our Father's business, why we have to be active in sharing our faith. God is using this time pause, this break between the 69th and 70 weeks of Daniel to exercise an infinite patience with one hope and one hope only that all who are appointed unto salvation will come. God is patient, unwilling that any should perish. Here's why that matters. When the 70th week of Daniel begins, this is the people of the ruler who will come. That's the Antichrist. Some people confuse this with Jesus because the King James uses the word prince here. But it's not Jesus. This is going further into the Great Tribulation. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolation, desolations, plural, have been decreed. Now the first portion of this prophecy all often has a, both a short-term and a long-term fulfillment. Well, the short-term fulfillment, the first fulfillment of this prophecy was 70 A.D., when the sadistic Roman general Titus captured Jerusalem and his troops utterly and completely destroyed the temple. It was the event that Jesus warned about in the Olivet Discourse. That's Matthew 24 and 25, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21. We have to understand that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking in the Olivet Discourse only about Israel. But he says none of this is the end. There's a growing movement, people who think they're really smart, called preterism, and they believe that all prophecy was fulfilled in 70 A.D. Now, those of us who have Bibles and we actually read them can understand that all of this prophecy has not been fulfilled. That's why he says the end will come like a flood or will continue in the present, in, uh, I'm sorry, future tense, It hasn't come in 70 A.D. That was just a partial fulfillment. But these other parts of the prophecy will be fulfilled in the future. Thus, they are yet to be fulfilled. That's why Gabriel is being so specific. After the sanctuary, after the temple is destroyed, the end will come, yet future. Come like a flood, and war will continue until the very end. And the end clearly 
has not yet come. Verse 27 says, He, this Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That one seven is the specific reference to the seven years of the Great Tribulation. As we see in our Revelation study, the Great Tribulation is broken up into two halves. The first three and a half years, relatively speaking, are peaceful compared to the last three and a half years. So we got three and a half years at the front, relative peace, but if you were here Friday night, if you weren't here, you can watch it at calvaryessay.com, nearly two billion people die in the first three and a half years. That's a pretty great tribulation to me. In the last two verses of Revelation chapter 6 clearly indicate that the beginning of the great tribulation is also the wrath of the Lamb. And they all know that to be true. So it's broken up. The first is a time when it will appear like peace will be true. This man, the Antichrist, will have answers to problems. He will be the one who solves the problem of peace between Jews and Arabs. He will come up with a plan that says we can build the Jewish temple and it can sit right next to the Muslim shrine. Jews will say, no, our temple can only be on the original foundation of Solomon's temple. And they're going to measure it. They're going to find that there's still room to set the Jewish temple and the Islamic shrine side by side. And Jews and Muslims are going to come together under the direction of this man, the Antichrist. And they're going to hail him as the greatest peacemaker in the history of the world. He will be educated. He will be articulate. He will be so charismatic. He will have the world eating out of the palm of his hand. We know he's going to be empowered by Satan. So none of us should be surprised. But this is the first half of the Great Tribulation. The second half is more horrible than we can describe. Of the first half, Paul describes it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them, not us, suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So that's the first half. The second half, in the middle of the seven at the three and a half year mark, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, here's what's going to happen. He's going to finally be unable to accept the fact anymore that God is being worshipped. And in the Holy of Holies, in the new temple, built in the Great Tribulation, he's going to demand that he's worshipped as God. The abomination of desolation, Daniel calls it, and, and it's going to be that he's expecting that they will worship him as God. Now, Jews, of course, won't do that, and that's when his ire is going to be turned on Jews, and he's going to pursue them, and God is going to protect them. It's interesting, but not germane to our study tonight. No longer will this man be called a man of peace, but everybody will know the true motive of his heart. And in the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, more people are going to die horrible deaths than you can imagine. And everybody who converts to Christianity and the revival will be the greatest revival in the history of the world. Those people will pay with their lives. The tribulation martyrs are seen throughout the book of Revelation under the altar of God, crying out, How long, O God, till you avenge our blood? And on a wing of the temple... He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, in closing tonight, I like the phraseology here, the end that is decreed is poured out on him. We know what that end is. This man, the Antichrist, along with the false prophet, are going to be the first two people ever thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is created for the fallen angels, we're told. And yet, at the end of the Great Tribulation, 
the Antichrist, the false prophet, 1,000 years before Satan and all the others who've rejected Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment are condemned in the lake of fire. This man, the Antichrist, and the false prophet can have it all to themselves. Jesus spoke of this man, warning Israel that they shouldn't be taken by surprise by these things. John chapter 5, verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me, but if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. And of course, that will be played out prophetically in the very end. Jews will believe that the Antichrist is their Messiah, and they will support him for the first three and a half years. You know, one thing has never changed. If you don't listen to Jesus... You'll listen to almost anybody. That's true of Israel. It's true of Christianity. Let me close with these questions. Are you ready for this? You know, while I can geek out over a study like this, I love the details. I realize this is not a thrilling Bible study. This is not one that everybody goes home with goosebumps over. But it's one we've got to make some important decisions about who we are and where we are at this time of history. Are you Living your life like you're ready for this moment. If Jesus is coming soon for his church, if we're going to be taken out of here, are you ready for that? And we can all easily say, yeah, I'm ready, I can't wait. But are you living your life now like you're ready for that? Men, are you loving your wife the way Jesus loved the church? giving himself up for her. Ladies, are you submitting to your husband's spiritual leadership? Not because he's right, but because you love Jesus. Moms and dads, are you treating your children like the gift from God that they are? Are you involving them in family devotions? Are you teaching them what God is teaching you? Are you living your life in such a way that people could see that you're a Christian and want what you have, want who you have? Are you living as though all these things could happen that quickly? Are you grateful? Are you grateful to him and is your life a picture of that gratitude? See, all we have to do is look around and the world that we live in is ripe for judgment. Are you actively sharing your faith? You know, when they say, well, you can't share your faith at work, you know, you could lose your job. Is Jesus willing to lose your job for? Are you willing to do that? Just is he worth the test? These are the questions that we've got to ask ourselves in these last days because I'm telling you, he's coming. Surely his return for his church is at hand. He can't wait much longer. Are you ready? I hope I am. I try and live my life like I am. But all I can tell you for sure as my heart so screams, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This is the future, as I said at the very beginning tonight, we can't manipulate. These things are going to happen, just like everything that happened has happened exactly on the timeline Gabriel declared it would. So too will all these things. The only thing that's ambiguous is how much longer is this pause? between week 69, which is already completed when Jesus came into Jerusalem, and the beginning of week 70, which is called the time of Jacob's trouble or distress. How much longer is this pause going to be? If we're wrong and the pause is another 2,000 years, well, our urgency will win people to Christ, we'll receive rewards for that. But if we're right... And Jesus is coming soon. We need to be about our Father's business. And that starts in your home, where you work, with your friends, 
They need Jesus. I pray that we're all ready as a church, Calvary. Father, thank you tonight. This is probably not counting Palm Sundays, the fourth time I've been privileged to teach this passage of Scripture. And every time it stirs my heart 